Okay, welcome again. This is the week eight webinar for the staff class. And the plan today, as always, um, I'll start out with Q&A and, um, and then Q&A throughout for whatever questions you might have. And then after that, we're going to continue an hypothesis test. As I told you last week, pretty much the rest of the entire class, we're doing hypothesis tests. And last time we did a hypothesis test for a single mean and a single proportion, it turns out that doesn't happen that often in the real world. Usually what you wanna do is you wanna show one thing is different or bigger than another. That's usually what you want, where you don't know either of them. And so we're gonna be looking at hypothesis tests for a comparison study. So in particular, we're gonna be looking at a hypothesis test and confidence intervals, by the way, for a difference between two population proportions. Then we'll get into a hypothesis test and a confidence interval for the difference between two population means when you have independent data. And I'll talk about what all that means and how to tell one from another in a bit. And then finally, we'll talk about a hypothesis tests and confidence intervals for two means where the data are dependent instead of independent. They're paired up, and we'll talk about some examples of those. So that is the plan today. And just to note, um, this is actually really important in terms of you know usage. It's used a lot, and it's also going to be what your project is all about. So today, la last week, we talked a little bit about project one, and this week, we're going to finish off talking about, I mean, project two. And this week we're gonna finish off talking about what the requirements are for project two, because you'll understand it all because it's actually about this chapter, which is um, chapter 10 is what we're moving into. Um, so I will talk about the project, more details than last time. I'm not gonna go, not gonna go into, under the basics that we talked about last time, we're gonna get into the details. And that is the plan. I want to remind you, this is this is week eight. What's important about the number eight? Yeah, it's an even number. So there is an exam this week. Okay. I make sure there's an exam every, every other week so that um, if we only had, you know, in the old days, we did two exams and it was just too stressful for everyone. Because if you did poorly on one of the exams, you didn't, you had no chance. Um, we're here, if you do poorly on one exam, but you do great on the rest, you're doing fine. And that's kind of how, the, there's a lot of reasons, that's one of the big reasons. So we do have an exam this week. And just a reminder, about half the exam will be chapters 9 and 10, and the other half will be chapters 1 through 8. That's kind of how all of these exams are, is that half-ish is on new stuff, and the other half is on old stuff. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, a little stressed every two weeks instead of really stressed every six weeks. That could happen, but you know, that's life, right? You'd much rather, you know, there's the things every day in life you're a little stressed about, but I try not to like make you totally stressed. Um, so that is the plan. And I'm going to open it up. Are there any questions that you might have about, you know, something about the class? Always happy to answer questions. Okay, if there aren't any questions now, um, feel free to ask them in the chat box or yell them out, and you know I can do my best answering them anytime. So let's do let's talk about hypothesis tests and confidence intervals, and really want to do these by example. Okay. And today, today, by the way, I'm doing some some uh, new ones. So this actually was just came out. And the question is, did Biden's job approval go down, kind of job approval rating in America, go down since last month? Okay. Can we know the percentage of all Americans that approved of Biden this month and last month?
Okay, the answer is definitely no. There's there's no way. Um, there's too many people in the country. And even if you're talking about adults, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of people. You can't survey them. Even if you tried, a lot of them would answer. You couldn't find most of them or a lot of them. So no, you can't, you cannot get the the full answer to this question. So what you do, and um, so Gallup did, they took a survey last month and they took a survey this month. So they did a survey each month and they compared the results of the survey. So here's what the data and data shows is they surveyed 1,013 Americans last month. Okay. And, and that means adult Americans. And they surveyed 1,016 this month. Okay. And we want to use a 5% level of significance because this is just politics. Politics almost always uses a 5% level of significance. And the results of the survey is this month, 38%. Last month, 41%. I'm oh, sorry, this is the last month, not last year. All right, well, this month, is it less than last month? Take a look, look at our numbers. Is it less than last month? 38% last month, 41% this month. So the answer is, we don't know. We only know about these 1,016 and 1,013 Americans, where there's, again, hundreds of millions of Americans. All we have is a survey. So yeah, in the survey, for the sample, definitely last month, this month had a drop in job approval, but that's just a sample. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two things. One is we're going to do a hypothesis test to see whether there's statistically significant evidence to show the population proportion has gone down in terms of job in terms of approval job approval and the other is not just has it gone down but how much has it gone down if you want to find out how much it's probably gone down hypothesis test won't do it what do you have to do yeah that's confidence interval so it's really important you understand that the reason behind each of them, what they do. Hypothesis tests will just say yes or no, down or not. Confidence intervals will say how much down. Any questions on that idea? All right, so we're used to H0 and H1. That happened last week. But what's new now is we're surveying. We surveyed last month. We surveyed this month. And what we want to do is we want to say, are they the same? So we don't have a number to compare this month to. Uh, confidence intervals aren't more accurate. They tell you different things. Confidence intervals will tell you kind of a range of how much the difference was. Hypothesis tell, will tell you whether there's statistically significant evidence if it did go down, do you see? They actually do different things. Yes, yes, this is what the discussion is gonna be on, <laughs> definitely. And I always try and you know focus the discussion on the main point. And I also focus the, um, the webinar on the main point. Okay, so it's definitely on this stuff. Okay. Now, confidence intervals don't tell you if they went down. They tell you how much they might have gone down by. It's a little bit different. Okay, let's do it and we'll see. So H naught. So first thing, these are proportions. What letter do we use for proportions? Yeah, we're gonna use P. And how about P? And I'm gonna go sub, how about um, how about T for this month? Sound good? Gotta make something up. Is equal to P 
How about sub L for last month? Any questions on that idea? Because the null hypothesis is the same, same proportions. The alternative hypothesis, on the other hand, is that it went down this month. Okay? So that means P sub T So this month is less than P sub L. Any questions? Any questions on writing down the null and alternative hypotheses? Notice now that we're in chapter 10, there's no numbers here. It's all comparing two different proportions. Any questions on that? Okay, so now I need a p-value. Okay, let's use a 5% level significance. Again, it's politics. So we're going to get a p-value. So to get a p-value, what do you think I have to do? I'm hoping you're there at this point in class. Um, the p-value is not 95%. What do I have to do to get a p value? Same thing, same similar thing I did last week. Yeah, we got to go to the calculator. And now we have to decide which calculator we're going to use. So what calculator or calculator number? Yeah, it's 19. By the way, notice um, we're getting pretty low here, uh, far down the screen. And that's because we're in week eight. We're getting towards the end. <laughs> there's 12 weeks, but there's only 11 of new material. So we're, we're getting there. So I'm going to click two proportions. And it's going to ask for the sample sizes. OK, the first sample was that, let's call it this month was the first, and this month was 1,016. And let's call last month the second sample, and that was 1,013. How do I find the number of successes based on the information I have? Yeah, I need to multiply n times p, and that'll give me my x. So n, again, was 1,016. p was 0.38. So now I'm going to go to my calculator. 1016 times 0.38. And you get 386.08. And since this is a, you know, how many people said yes is 386. And similarly, I'm going to take 1,013 times 41% or 0.41, and it gives you about 415. Any questions on that? That clear? Um, well, I just ran it to the nearest whole number. I use the rules of rounding. So 415.33, 3 is less than 5, so that means you keep it 415. Right here, 415.33. Uh, the other one, let's double check. Maybe I made a mistake, but I don't think so. Let's see, 1016.38. It's 0 0.08, do you see? And zero is definitely less than five. <laughs> so that's what happened with the other one. Okay, any questions so far? 
Okay, we're gonna go for not pooled, just a hint. And now we want, according to our hypothesis, PT is less than LT, I mean PL. So I'm gonna use that less than. What do you think we should use for a confidence interval for this kind of thing? Because this calculator is gonna do everything for us. What do you think of standard confidence? Yeah, 0. 0.595 this is politics. 0.95 is what you almost always use for politics. And hit calculate. Okay. And again, what's new here, not you, you know, you don't even know this, but these pictures weren't here um, a few months ago. <laughs> so I put them in. But we have a Z, that's like the Z score of negative 1.37. So not quite an outlier. We have P is 0. .0. So the Z, Z is a test statistic, by the way. If I ask for the test statistic, that's the, the Z. P value is 0 0.085. Based on that, what is the conclusion? Just a shorthand conclusion, and then I'll make it longer. Yeah, P is large, so we fail to reject. So we can say there is statistically insignificant evidence to conclude that the population proportion of all Americans who now um, approve of Biden's job is less than, actually I'll approve of Biden's uh, population portion of all Americans who now approve of Biden's job this month is less than last month's. Any questions on that? Any questions? Okay. Now let's interpret the p-value. It's very similar to what we did last week. We can say that if the Biden's job approval, so in other words, if H naught is true, so if the population proportion of um, all Americans who approve of Biden's job is the same this month as it was last month. And if we survey Another, maybe I'll write uh, a different group of um, 1,013 Americans last month and 1,016 Americans this month then there would be a, and remember our p-value is about 0 0.085, so about 8.5% chance that the new study, or that um, the new study would have this month's job approval rate at least 3% higher than 
lower than last month's. How did I get that 3%? Because I know in um, last week's discussion post, a lot of you had trouble with that part. A lot of you just ignored it and didn't even write that part. You can't just say the job approval rate will be less than last month. That's not what you could say. It has to be at least 3% lower than last month. How did I get that 3%? You don't need too fancy a calculator brain, but you, you probably should do it in your head. You know how I got that? Yeah, it's the difference between 38% and 41%. So from 41%, it went down to 38%. So that's a 3% drop. Do you see how that works? And that's how I got that 3%. Again, that was that was something a lot of you had trouble with, was the getting that number for that p-value. Any questions on this? Okay, let's interpret the level of significance. So the nice thing is I'm at, we're on all in class, I'm at a computer. I can just copy and paste everything up to the word A, all of that. And I'll read it again. If the population proportion of all Americans who approve of Biden's job is the same this month as it was last month, and if we surveyed a different group of 1,013 Americans last month and 1,016 Americans this month, then there would be a, okay, our level of significance was 0.05 or 5% chance. that we would end up falsely concluding that now we can just write down what the conclusion part of it was. I love copy and paste. That the population proportion of all Americans who now approve of Biden's job this month is less than that of last month. Any questions on any of these interpretations so far? Any questions? Okay, let's look at a confidence interval. The good news is the calculator does it all for us. So the confidence interval's lower bound is negative 0.07, and upper bound is gonna round to the nearest um, two decimals, maybe. Negative 0.07 to 0.01. And again, on, on the computer homework, do whatever it tells you. If it says four decimals, go four decimals. So always pay attention to what it tells you. Okay, now we need to interpret the confidence interval. Okay. This is not the same thing as interpreting the confidence level. This is the interval I care about. What's the first word to interpret the confidence interval? The main interpretation. Yeah, with, with 95% confidence between, actually we can say that, um, so with 95% confidence, we have negative 0 0.07 and 0 0.01. So we can say that this month's population proportion of all Americans who um, approve uh, Biden's job is between 7% lower and 1% higher. than the uh, population proportion for last month. Any questions on that? Do you see how I got the 7% lower and 1% higher? 
because negative 0.07 is 7% lower. That's what the negative tells me. And it wants an apostrophe. There we go. Any questions at all on doing a confidence interval for two proportions, for the difference between two proportions? OK, if not, let's do another example. OK, I can do a little less of this one, but same, same important stuff. OK, so here's a question. Do single women spend more time cooking than single men? What do you think? Any guesses? OK. So some of, some of you don't want to guess, I don't know. So I want to let you know, I want to give you a heads up on this one. I made these numbers up. <laughs> yeah, you don't know, but you probably know some single moon and single men, <laughs> even if you're not one of both. <laughs> but you probably know some. OK, so I did make these numbers up, but you can imagine doing a study like this. OK, the 35 single women who surveyed averaged 58 minutes a day cooking, and their standard deviation was 12 minutes. The 38 single men who were surveyed averaged 46 minutes a day cooking, and their standard deviation was 16 minutes. What can be concluded at the 5% level of significance? Also interpret the 95% confidence interval. Okay. So for this one, this is very important. The survey question is, how much time do you spend cooking a day? And then a person is going to give a number like 52 minutes. Does that make sense? They're not going to say yes. They're not going to say no. So you do not use the letter P for these. Got it? This is going to be a hypothesis test for the difference between two means. So H naught will be mu sub W is equal to mu sub N. Any questions on that? And because of this word more, H1 will be mu sub W is greater than mu sub M. Any questions on that idea? Any questions? Okay, so that, those are going to be our null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, we use a level of significance of 5%, so we need a p-value. Will this calculator work? Yeah, definitely not. So I need to go back to the calculator menu. Which calculator are we going to use? Yeah, 18. We have two independent samples with statistics. OK, so I want to mention something very important. These are independent because if you look at the group of men and the group of women, they're not paired up. This isn't a husband and wife idea. If it was a husband and wife, instead of just a bunch of women and a bunch of men, if it was a husband and wife, this would be dependent. But this is not. This is independent because this first man has nothing to do with the first woman. Does that make sense? Or if they did brothers and sisters or something, then it would be dependent. But this is independent because they're not paired. So I'm going to use two independent samples with statistics. I don't have data here. I have statistics. And now I just could put in stuff. The sample sizes were 35 for the single woman. And for the single man, it was 38. The sample mean for the women was 58. The sample mean for the men was 46.
The sample standard deviation for the women is 12. The sample standard deviation for the men was 16. Any questions so far? Okay, we're asked is do single women spend more time cooking than single men? We have a greater than here, so we need to make it greater than. Any questions on that? I do want to warn you, it's much easier to watch me do it than to do it all yourself. But you can always relook at what I'm doing. Our confidence level is 95%. And I hit calculate. And that gives me everything we need. Okay. So T is our test statistic in this case. Okay. By the way, was our sample size large enough to be able to make this work? What do you think? Was that 3535? Oh, it's 38. I have a typo here. one more time that's better yeah our sample sizes were large enough how come how do you know our sample sizes were large enough yeah and notice 35 is greater than 30 38 is also greater than 30. You need both of them to be greater than 30. And I didn't mention it with the proportions, but you need all four NP, NQ. So N1, P1, N2, Q1. So all four to be greater than five. So it's the same idea as before, but now we have twice as much work. Sorry about that. <laughs> Any questions on that idea? Okay, so our P value is quite small. 0. 0.00026. Any questions so far? If the p-value is really small, what do we get to do? Say we're right, we reject the null hypothesis, and we can state there is statistically significant evidence to conclude that, now that's what we got, we're looking at the population mean cooking time for a woman is more or larger than the population mean cooking time, maybe, yeah, large is fine. Cooking time for men. And again, I made up this, you know, the numbers, but you can imagine doing this survey. Any questions at all on this? Any questions? Okay, now our confidence interval. That's given here. So our lower bound is 5 point, let's just go 5.4 to 18.6. So the confidence interval doesn't say that it is longer. It tells you how much longer, okay? And that is, you know, more than five minutes. That's what we're looking at. Do you see the difference? But it's not an hour longer. So it confidence interval tells you different information than a hypothesis test. Okay, to interpret the confidence interval, we can say with 95% confidence. We 
the population mean time women's men, a single woman, cooking is between 5.4 minutes longer, actually minutes, and 18.6 minutes longer than the population mean time single men spend cooking. Any questions on this confidence interval? Any questions? Okay, see how important this stuff is? It allows us to do comparisons. When you don't, we don't know the population of men, we don't know the population of women, so we can, but we can still compare the men to the women, even though you don't know either of their populations. And that comes up a lot when you're doing comparison studies. All right, ready for, uh, they're a little weird, weird, but they definitely seem useful. Okay, wanna hear a way I personally used it? Okay, this happened a while ago. It happened about um, six years ago. And I noticed something. No, it's not rigging the casinos, but it's still making money. <laughs> yeah, it's still making money. So I noticed something. And again, this is something you may may not remember. But six years ago, who was the president of the United States six years ago? Yeah, Trump. Okay, and again, I, I never will tell you who you're supposed to like or not like or to vote for. But I like to tell you historical things. <laughs> And there's something that Trump did pretty often, and that is he would tweet about something about China being angry at them, being angry at China. Do you remember those days? Trump used to tweet a lot, and that was one of the big tweets he did was something bad about China. Okay. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Now, yeah. This is this is why I smile. There's a reason I smile about it. I noticed something. I noticed that right after he tweeted about China, some bad thing about how bad something is, our stock market would go down. But then within a few weeks, it would come back up. Okay, and I watched it happen over and over again. Do you, I don't know if you remember, you may, you may not even have noticed. But I notice, I, I always try to make money if I can, not in a bad, immoral way or anything. So then I went and I looked for a stock that seemed to be more reactive. Yeah, our China, our stock market is connected to China's. And I looked for a stock that seemed to be more reactive than, other, than you know, than most stocks. And that stock was NVIDIA. Have you heard of that? In those days, almost no one had heard of it, but now it's actually a big deal, okay? So what I did is I wanted to see if my, just my best guess was right, but instead of just a best guess, what I want to do is statistics. So here's what I did, and I call it play the tweet. I was playing the tweet. So I did a sample, very small sample size, because again, those are the kind of things it's not like I can wait for 30 times of it happening because then he's not president anymore. <laughs> so I did a small sample size, sample size of six, which is way small. So big, 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 big. Um, I've got to really, really um, use that assumption that the sampling distributed, the population means are normal. Okay. May not be perfect, but it's as good as I can get. And here's the data I collected. There was tweet day and one week later. And you'll notice on tweet day, it went down to 106. A week later, it was at 113. The next time it was 110, 124. 
115, 120, 122, 118, 114, 127, 116, 128. Okay. Over the long run, it didn't just go, you know, up. It just went, it went up a week after the tweet day, but then it went back down. So one of the things that you'll notice with this example is that this 106 is paired with the 113. Because 106 was tweet day. 113 was a week later from that tweet. This 124 was not a week later from the 106. These are paired up. The 124 was a week later from the 110. Do you see how that works? Any questions on that idea? So what I wanted to do is I wanted to form a hypothesis to see if, I wanted to see a couple things. One is, was this consistent is the population mean higher a week later compared to the tweet day? Do you see how that works? Because if it is higher, then what should I do investment-wise? Any thoughts? Yeah, I invest in the day of, wait a week, and then sell, okay? But only, only if I have statistics to support my claim. Otherwise, it's just imaginary. Does that make sense? And you never want to be imaginary when you're investing money. <laughs> you want to, like, you know, it doesn't mean you're 100% confident, but, you know, you got a pretty good confidence. So here's the thing. Let's write down h naught and h1. So h naught is mu sub d equals zero. So this is this is different than we've seen before. The letter d here stands for difference. The mean difference is zero, which is the same thing as saying nothing has changed in terms of the population mean difference. h1 is mu sub d is less than zero. And by the way, the way it always works is first minus second. So notice 106 is less than 113. 106 minus 113 is less than zero. Any questions on how I got H naught and H1? Is that clear? Okay. And mu sub D is Tweet day's population means stock price of NVIDIA. And one week later's population means stock price of NVIDIA. And subtract the two. Any questions so far? What do you think I need to do next? I think I'm going to hide this, even though it's there. What do you think I need to do next? Yeah, calculator. And I'm going to copy this first row. Can I use this calculator, the one we just used? Yeah, definitely not. We need data. And this is not independent. We have dependent data, not independent. It's very important to understand the difference between independent and dependent. So I'm going to go back to the calculator menu. And then, which one do I use? Which calculator? Yep, number 20. Two dependent samples with data. Data one, I'm going to paste it in. I got to separate by commas, so I got to stick commas in there. 106, comma 110, comma 115, comma 122, comma 114, comma 116. Okay, by the way, spaces are fine. The This calculator ignores spaces. 
And then let's copy the one week later ones. And you get 113, I need to put commas in, comma 124, comma 120, comma 118, comma 127, comma 128. Okay. Now in my hypothesis, mu sub d is less than zero. Yeah, space has turned out to be fine. I don't know if you could do like one space three to be 13, but you probably wouldn't do that anyway. <laughs> okay, so I want less than. And confidence level? Probably 90% confidence level. What do you think? This is one of those where the sample size is small, so you might want to do 90% to make it a little narrower. But that's up to you. I can go 90% and hit calculate. All right. There's my test statistic, negative 2.82. Our p-value is 0 0.018. Why is that? Good. Yeah, that's a small p-value. And that's actually really small when you have a sample size of six. <laughs> okay, so what's the conclusion when you have a small p-value? Shorthand before I do the long thing. Yeah, the conclusion is you have statistically significant evidence. So let's write it out. There is statistically significant evidence to conclude that the population mean price of NVIDIA is higher one week after the tweet than on the day of the tweet. Okay. The confidence interval, by the way, was 13.42, 2.24. Okay. So now let's interpret the confidence interval. With 90% confidence, the population mean price of NVIDIA goes up by between $2.24 and $13.42 from tweet to one week later. See, if it was one cent to three cents, it's probably not worth it. Do you see how that confidence interval helps? All right, so what do you think I did? You know, five years ago or so? Five or six years ago, five and a half years ago, I think it was. I day traded. I waited around, okay, they, even though it's not every day, but I waited until the tweet happened and I put money in NVIDIA, waited a week later, and I took it out. And then waited longer. I was the only one that was like hoping for a China tweet for that reason. <laughs> I didn't know anyone else that was hoping. And do you think I made money? Yes. I made about I made about like three or four hundred percent interest, which is huge in just a year or two. So it was a really good one. Um, it was, no, I don't do options. There's a whole different reason for options, but I'm not going to get into that. It's a little complicated. So I wasn't doing options. I was just putting a lot of money in and taking out. Okay. And there, there's complicated issues that have nothing to do with statistics. More like taxes and stuff like that. <laughs> so I just won't get into it. But I could have done options. Um, but anyway, um, and that's not, this isn't the only example, but I can't give you every example I've ever done because that would take too long. But that's one of the things I like to do is I look for patterns and then use those patterns to make money. And it's a great thing. I recommend it. Okay, but you have to understand statistics or you're going to fool yourself. Any questions on this idea? And this is real, by the way. 
This isn't some like false story. Okay, and of course, um, I get, I'm not doing it now. Do you know why? This particular thing? Yeah, he's not president. Okay, and in fact, as soon as he was impeached, he stopped tweeting. I don't know if you know that, but I noticed it. <laughs> that was the end of doing it. Okay, so, you know, you do it until the pattern's over, and then you find another pattern. Uh, Biden's a lot harder to find a pattern for. Doesn't necessarily make him a bad president. He's just hard to find a, a pattern. <laughs> uh, he doesn't do strange things like Trump did. That were patterned. Any questions at all on this example? Okay, I want to mention a couple things because one of the hardest parts about this stuff is to recognize when it's paired or dependent versus independent. Okay, this is, I've given you a couple examples, but let me give you some more. Okay, um, another example when you have dependent data is when you ask a group of people two survey questions that are comparable. So that would be like saying on a scale of one to 10, how much do you like your mother? And then on a scale of one to 10, how much do you like your father? And then you might wanna say, is there a difference between how much people like their mother and how much people like their father? Does that make sense? That would be paired because it's one person giving two answers. And you can subtract that person's two answers. Is that clear? Any questions on that idea? Another paired example would be, um, let's suppose we wanted to say, does Mammoth Ski Resort get more snow than Heavenly in Tahoe? And what you looked at is maybe you looked at 35 different months, just randomly throughout the year to see how much snow for each month Mammoth got and how much snow Tahoe got. Do you see that? And that would also be paired. It's not one person answering two questions, but it's one month answering or one week, however you want to cut it, giving two numbers. Yeah, it has to be the same person or the same month or the same week. You see how that works? Or the same day, however you want to use that. Okay. On the other hand, if you wanted to find out whether, um, let's say, whether cats, whether dogs eat more than cats, and you just looked at 45 dogs, and maybe 45 cats. Just a bunch of cats and a bunch of dogs. They have nothing to do with each other. That would be independent. Do you see how that would work? Any questions on the difference between independent and dependent data? Okay. Um, with proportions, that one should be the obvious one because that is the yes, no survey question. I want to mention a few more things. One is confidence intervals versus the hypothesis testing. The hypothesis test is to answer a yes, no question, not the survey question, but to say, is this, is this bigger than the other thing? Or is this smaller? Confidence intervals are how much bigger or how much smaller? Do you see the difference? And that's the difference between what they at what they do. Okay, so it's really important you get those down, or it's going to be a mess for you. Any questions at all on those ideas? Any questions? Okay, it's going to be very important in your project to know about all this stuff. Okay, so here's a secret word. The secret word is two. Why is it two? Why is the secret word two? Yep. Yeah. It's not just about pairing, but it's about comparing, I think is a better word. Okay. 
So it's about comparing two means or comparing two proportions. Does that make sense? Okay, do I provide templates for the discussion and exams? Um, no, but it's real similar to the template we had last week. That's why I don't need a template anymore, right? You see, with 95% confidence, I had with XX confidence, the population, it was either mean or proportion, do you see? Things haven't changed that much, but now it's one higher than the other, that kind of thing. So it's very, it's very similar to last week. That's why I'm not doing, that's why there's no need to, because it's, it's really the same. But now you're just saying this is bigger than that instead of this is bigger than seven. You see the difference? That's really the only difference. Okay. And again, practice, practice, practice. That helps. I've done some examples and there's others in the other videos and, you know, lots of examples. All right. What I want to do now is talk about the project. So again, here's the syllabus. And I'm not going to go the, to the bland details because we did that last week. But I will let you know that project two is due March 24th, which is almost at the end of this course, by the way. Okay. So just timeline. What should you do within maybe the next, maybe in seven days or so? Maybe eight or nine days. So first week of March. What, what do you think I recommend you doing? Any thoughts? The hint is think about project one. No ideas? Get a group. No, that's get a group should have happened last week. If you don't have one, you better do it now. <laughs> That should have already happened. Okay. <laughs> um, definitely don't collect the data. What you want to do is you want to come up with your proposal and post it on the Project 2 discussion board. And your proposal means y'all's proposal as a group. Okay. The three of your proposals kind of thing, if there's a group of three. Does that make sense? And let me go and click on project two. If I remember right, we didn't go through all these details last time. Okay. So project two is to use a confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Okay. It's all about those two things. To support or show lack of support for a research project. Okay. So project one, all you are doing is looking at a sample mean and sample standard deviation, a bunch of charts. Here, you're gonna be doing confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. That needs to be the focus, okay? Um, you do still have to have a client, okay? And it is gonna be from this chapter, chapter 10, where you're comparing two means, got it? You could do independent data or you could do dependent data, okay? The one thing that you have to do is do it right. <laughs> so if you're using independent data, make sure you use independent data calculate, you know, calculations. If you're using dependent data, make sure you look at the dependent data. Does that make sense? So you could do either that. So in terms of maybe within 10 days or so, write down your null hypothesis, write down your alternative hypothesis, and it doesn't have to be a survey question. You could just collect data. This is very different. Okay. I think I mentioned that last week, if I remember right. But it has to be comparing two means. Got it? You're going to post. You're going to post your hypotheses. Write down to your client is. Explain how you're going to get the data. And it's fine to use the easiest. What's the easiest way of collecting data in terms of sampling techniques? Yeah, convenience sampling is fine. You don't have to use convenience sampling, but you know, I'm not going to take off points as long as you say that's what you did. Does that make sense? 
Okay. Unlike, uh, so the sample size greater than 30, but here it's two sample sizes because you're comparing two things. So you're going to have two sets of data that are at least 31. Do you see that? And that is important. So don't do 30, 31 and 31, which is a total of 62. Got it? Okay. If you ask 30, right, because that'll be 62 answers. Do you see? 31 people, two questions is 62 answers. Do you see how that works? And that's fine too. And then it would be paired. Make sure the questions are comparable. Do not ask the people, how tall are you and how many calories did you eat today? What's wrong with that? If you ask 31 people, how tall are you and how many? Yeah, you can't say, well, you know, five foot eight is more than a hundred and, you know, more than a thousand and twenty calories. It doesn't even make sense. Five foot eight minus 120 calories means nothing. Does that make sense? So they, they should be same units and comparable. Is that clear? Okay. Just a note, if census data is, are available, then this is not an acceptable project. If you can easily just grab the census, then that's not okay. You also have to collect the data. You can't use someone else's data that they've already collected. Yeah, question like the mom and dad situation, that 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 would be okay. You know, I mean, don't just use the one I told you to use, so. <laughs> Do something that interests you. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And they don't all have to, you don't have to do a survey question. Okay. So an example that, you know, I've seen, I've seen a group use was they wanted to find out whether Amazon prices were cheaper than, um, than prices that they saw at the store. Okay. And you could look at, you could make that that you would probably make that dependent data is you'd look at 31 different items that are sold on Amazon and sold at the store at the you know regular old store and use those. Does that make sense? And that's fine. Okay. And notice then you're not asking people a survey question. You're collecting data and you're not going to be able to find every single item on Amazon. Good luck. <laughs> That's not going to happen or every item that's ever sold in a store. So that's why census data can't happen, which is good. You want, it, it needs to be impo pretty much impossible to do census data. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. So, the, so the, again, you're going to post it on the Project 2 discussion board. Strongly recommend don't wait too long. So I would say within the next 10 days, have your group do that. And then I'll let you know if it can work. I'll also let you know how you might want to make some adjustments if you need to. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, and by the way, same rules last time. You're not, you're not allowed to do any surveys on children. Okay, that's very against the law. Don't do it. Okay. So just don't even go there. Sound good? Okay. Um, then do you remember, let me grab it. Do you remember in project one, you use this spreadsheet, which you must use? Do you remember using this? All right. Here's the only difference. Any guess looking at the spreadsheet? What we're looking at won't work. So you have to do something. Very easy, very, very easy. Let's see, I'll jump it in. Yeah, 
We're not doing one variable stats. We don't have one variable. We're comparing two variables. So we've got a two variable stats. By the way, regression, chi-squared ANOVA, those are the um, next things that come weeks after. Don't even think about using those in your project. I will zap you point-wise. So you need to use this two variable stats. And then you're going to put your data values for the first thing, your data values for the second thing in A and B. Any questions on that idea? Is that clear? All right, then you're going to move your eyeball a bit. And either you're going to go to this J and K, which is difference independent, or you can go to N and O, which is stats for dependent difference. And that really is going to depend on your survey, but you need to do the right one, depending on whether you're using independent or dependent data. Is that clear? Okay, then let's suppose you did dependent, like say the mom and dad one I just kind of gave up. Then it'll tell you what the mean difference is, 0.5 in this case for these examples. By the way, this sample size is too small. So, you know, don't use my numbers. Don't even think about it. So remember to get rid of the numbers, you just highlight them and hit the hit the backspace and that'll get rid of those numbers. We have the standard deviation difference of the difference. We have the minimum difference, Q1 difference, median difference, Q3 difference, maximum difference, hypothesis test, uh, maximum difference. All of these should be a very small part of your project, just a few sentences. Don't make that pages and pages long. It's not the idea. What should be pages and pages long is this T value. That's the test statistic. And then only one of these three will be relevant to your study. If you have a not equal to for your H not, H1, I mean, then you'll use the P2 value, two tailed P value. If you have a greater than, you use the right tailed p-value. If you have a less than, you use the left tailed p-value. Only one will be relevant. Is that clear? Then there's a level of confidence. And just note with this calculator, you do point, you do 0.95, not 0.95. Just the way I made it. And that'll give you your conf the lower bound for the confidence interval and the upper bound. Is that clear? Any questions? It'll also give you the standard error, and that's important. Any questions on finding all these things? If you had independent data, it's going to be very similar. Okay? All the same important stuff. Any questions at all on kind of using this spreadsheet? Okay. If not, let me go back to the project requirements. So you're going to be writing down the summary, the key summary statistics, just the basics, and don't spend a whole lot of time on the summary statistics, except you're going to um, spend a lot of time on one specific statistic. Okay. And that is the standard error. Kind of like in project one, where we had standard deviation, standard error is the key. So I want to let you know a few things. One is the standard error needs to come up three times. One time is just, in general, looking at that number and deciding what it means to the client. A second time is for the confidence interval you're going to decide whether that standard error was small enough to make the client accept or be happy about the information, or at least useful, that the confidence interval gives. Does that make sense? Okay. If it, so if the confidence interval is not that useful because it's too wide, 
Okay, let's suppose you wanted to find a confidence interval for the difference between, I don't know, adult male heights and adult female heights. And you found it was somewhere between negative seven feet and positive nine feet. Is that useful at all? Right? That you just found out that men are somewhere between seven feet shorter and nine feet taller than women on average. Have you learned anything from what I just told you? Why is it not useful? Yeah, it's too wide. Okay, we already knew that. So instead, you might want it to be have a margin have a standard error of an inch. Okay, or a margin of error of an inch. So how big a sample size would you need to make the standard error small enough so you got your one inch margin of error? And that's gonna take a little calculation. You know, tutors are there for you, I'm there for you if you need help, but make sure you get the help. Does that make sense? So you're going to talk about how you can get that standard error to what you want it to be so that you have a margin of error that's just good enough for the client. Any questions on that? Um, not for this particular one. This is one you're going to have to, you know, think about. So remember, you can think about, you know, if you wanted to put the standard error by a factor of two, then what factor would you have to increase the sample size by? So you don't need a fancy calculator for this, but you have to understand it. So if you wanted to make the standard error decrease by a factor of two, how much bigger does your sample size must be? What factor? You remember how that works? Been a little while. It'd be a factor of four because two squared is four. Where if you needed the standard error to be three times smaller, then you'd need your sample size to be nine times larger. Does that make sense? Do you see why you don't need a fancy calculator for that? Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so the other piece is you want to look at the standard error and how it relates to the hypothesis test and the results of the hypothesis test. So the question is, are you satisfied with the results of the hypothesis test? Or do you think that your sample size was too small? Does that make sense? When are you satisfied when when do you when are you satisfied with your sample size? What would make you be satisfied with your sample size in terms of the hypothesis test? Any thoughts? I don't see you all jumping in. Let's suppose your p-value, let's say your level of significance was 5%, okay? And let's say your p-value is 0.04. Are you satisfied with your sample size? If your level of significance is 0.05 and your p-value is 0.04. Yeah, you are satisfied because you rejected the null hypothesis, which is was you know what you thought was true, which means that was your goal. You see? What if your p-value was 0.06? Are you satisfied? If it was 0.06. Yeah, no, because now you're not able to reject the null hypothesis, but it's still kind of small, but not small enough for you to like cheer. Do you see? And say, I got it. What if you're what if your sample size, what if your p-value was 0.81? Are you satisfied with your sample size? Yeah, because then you'd like, yeah, my null hypothesis, my alternative hypothesis, I was hoping it was true, but 
doesn't look true. It's not even worth trying. Do you see? And that could happen. You never know until you do your your um, sampling. Any questions on that? Okay. I do have a video on the standard error. Just to get, I'm going to let you watch it. You can always click on it and watch it from the syllabus. I'm from the project two requirements from the syllabus. And that'll give you a little reminder about standard error. Okay. I want to talk about a um, step-by-step process. Okay. Again, step one was partner. Step two was post your idea. Write down your null hypothesis. Write down your alternative hypothesis. Make sure that it could work by posting it, and I'll tell you. Step three, do you remember what step three was in hypothesis testing? I told you that the step-by-step uh, -step was really important to do in the right order. Do you remember the next step? No, definitely not get out of the data. Not ready for that yet. Any ideas? Okay, let me tell you. It's think about a type one and type two error. And then based on the type one and type two error, look at the ramifications and decide whether to use a 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or 0 0.1 level of significance. You need to do that before you gather the data. Any questions on that? And in your write-up, that needs to come before you even see the data. That should be pretty close to the beginning of the project. Very first thing would be a paragraph of just introduction. You know, write down what your hypotheses are, H0 and H1, in symbols and in words. Then you write down the, the type 1 and type 2 error and what the ramifications are. And then you write down what you decided on your level of significance based on it. Does that make sense? So you could write that pro a project before you even collect your data. You probably should. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it doesn't... There will be a type 1 and type 2 error, so you don't have to include that in your proposal. What's important is what your hypotheses are. And that you can collect the data. <laughs> because, you know, if you, you look for something where the data can't be collected, then, then it's silly. Does that make sense? So if you wanted data on, I don't know, comparing, let's say you wanted to compare um, people under 30 and people over 30 on how their health was after walking on Mars. Why will that not work? Exactly. You have a sample size of zero. And I would let you know that can't work. You need a different project. Do you see that? <laughs> so that's the kind of thing that I can help you with. Does that make sense? I, I wanted to give you one that even you knew was wrong. <laughs> but there's others that may not be as obvious to be right or wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, population, now the population size could be large because we're talking in the future. It'd be cool if, you know, and couple hundred years from now, we have lots of people, you know, thousands of people that have gone to Mars and kind of a cool vacation. <laughs> but it's not happening today. <laughs> okay, any questions on that idea? Okay, so in your paper, I just want to highlight confidence interval for the difference and interpret it. Okay, this is a, there's a few really important things. One is Make sure you explain how you decided on choosing your confidence level, what the confidence level means, and not just the template. This is like a paragraph talking about it, okay? So why did you choose a 90% or a 99% instead of a 95%? Explain. And with confidence intervals, unlike um, level significance, you can look at the 95%, you could look at the 99%, you could look at the 90%, and you can look at the pros and cons of each and make the decision based on the pros and cons. And then 
whichever one you choose, you say, this is the one I chose and this is why. And this is what it tells us. Any questions on that? So this confidence interval part is a huge part, usually pages of your project, not a paragraph. It goes on, it goes for a while, okay? You should explain what new information is revealed from this confidence interval. Explain what decisions are going to be made based on the confidence interval. Just a note, it's not written here, but how many numbers are in a confidence interval? How many numbers show a confidence interval? It's a really obvious answer. Yeah, there's two, the lower bound and there's the upper bound. So I want you to write some sentences on how the client is going to make a decision based on the lower bound and how the client is going to make a decision based on the upper bound separately. Talk about whether, so if you choose a 90% because the confidence interval with the 99% is way too wide, talk about how big a sample size you would need to make the standard error small enough so you can get your 99% the same width as the 90% 90, 90 that you currently have. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, explain the ramifications of the population mean difference not lying in the interval after the new decisions are made. Okay, that's gonna be important. Okay, and don't just use the template. This is, the template is so you can write it on a test in just quickly with a sentence. But here I want you to fully explain with paragraphs. Got it? Any questions on the confidence interval? That's a main part of the paper. The other main part of the paper is the hypothesis test. So that's why I'm focusing on these two. So make sure that that should be most of your paper. So hypothesis test for the difference and its interpretations. Be sure to state the null on, on alternative hypothesis and the motiva motivation you had for an alternative hypothesis. Why is it that you thought the alternative hypothesis would be true? And why would that help the client make decisions? Everything's about decisions, by the way. Include replication, repercussions of type one and two type two error before even talking about the hypothesis test and the p-value and all that stuff. So, you know, order of stuff. Okay, make sure you let the repercussions drive your level of significance decision and explain your reasoning, okay? And these are repercussions not to general public. Who are the repercussions to? Yes, yeah, the client, okay? Find the p-value, interpret it, and don't just write it in you know, that little half sentence or one sentence thing. Make sure you really expand on it. What decisions will the client make based on the results of the hypothesis test? Okay. Now, after looking at the p-value, will there be a reason to conduct a new study with a larger sample size? Okay. Decide on your new sample size. How big a sample size might you need based on your p-value? Okay, and if you don't need a bigger sample size, explain why. Okay, I don't think I wrote it here, but I'm saying it now. Um, after looking at your results of the hypothesis test, revisit the type one and type two error. Only one will be relevant, which one, and how, Worried should you be now of that error? And that'll have a lot to do with the p-value, just to let you know that. Any questions on that? Okay, 
Then um, kind of shortly, what assumptions did you make in finding the confidence interval and p-value? Okay. And um, don't get confused about the word assumption and conclusion based on the central limit theorem. Okay. Then this is a paper. So there should be introduction, a body, and a conclusion. The conclusion really should be the main takeaways from the confidence interval and the hypothesis test. Okay, that's what the conclusion should be about. It's the main takeaway for those two things. Okay. Okay, and then just like before, further studies, and that could be about how big a sample you might need. And it might be other, other questions you might ask or, or other items you might survey, you know, depending on what you're looking at. Does that make sense? Okay, I don't give a example of a done project because what I found is there's too much copying and pasting if I do that. But here's what I do is I have a, I'll let you click on the link and it'll give example of feedback that I've given for project two drafts. So you know what goes wrong. Does that make sense? Okay. And then just like project one, some days before, then make sure you write out your um, draft and send it to me enough days beforehand. Got it? And unlike winter, I want to actually, actually, this will probably be fine. No, I don't want to go there. Never mind. But um, but you can post on the project one, a uh, project two discussion boards any questions you have, and I'll be do my best to answer them. Any questions at all about the project? Any questions? Did that help having that little kind of go through of what the project's all about? Okay, so really important. Um, and then again, if I go back to the syllabus, I just want to emphasize it. Project is, you know, 10% of the grade. So, you know, don't just ignore it. <laughs> you know, it, it is a pretty important piece. Okay, it's not 90% of the grade, but, you know, it's a, it's a chunk. I want to give you one more weird thing. Um, and that is something about Canvas. When Canvas, when Canvas predicts your grade, it takes your project one grade and assumes you're going to get the same grade on project two to give you your predicted grade percent. So if, let's suppose your course grade percent is 80% and your project one grade was 95%. Then if your project two grade was, is 90%, your course grade will go down. Okay, and that's just the way Canvas does the math. Because what it does is it takes the average of the projects Put that as your project percent. And right now, it's assume, it assumes that your project two will be the same grade as your project one. So if your project two is a lower grade than your project one, your course grade will go down. If your project two is a higher grade than project one, your course grade will go up in the way Canvas is reading the course grade percent. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't like lose you on that. But I just want to give you so you don't like freak out when you see your course grade, you know, change, even though your project two was higher percent than your course grade percent, your course grade percent will go down if it was lower than the project one and vice versa. Just figured I'd mention that because it's a little confusing with uh, Canvas. Any questions at all about the project? Okay, if there aren't any questions, I think we'll we'll call it. Then um, I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, wait, there was a question. 
uh, if you can if you can get the same grade as project one, even though it's higher than the canvas grade, your course, yeah, if you get the same grade as project one, your course grade remains exactly the same. And that's how canvas does the computation. It's not me. Don't get, don't yell at me on it, please. That's why I'm giving you the heads up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't like it either. But there's not much I can do about it. Okay, so let me um, stop the recording.